Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 2, Chapter 8 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. And this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Cameron and I know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. No literary critique, sirs. Or ma'am. <laughs> We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. And a quick warning, today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence and is not recommended for children. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we would really like to hear from you, and we do really mean that. So send any feedback or comments that you have to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, chapter eight. The chapter begins with a quote, The harder the world, the fiercer the honor, by Dancer. Now, do you think this goes back to the cycle of society where hard times create tough men and tough men create good times and good times create weak men? I'm not really sure, but I, I, I kind of believe that it does point to that where it's hard times. And so they're fighting very fiercely for this. And so it does create that kind of to me, that's what I get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was thinking about it. There's always going to be bad people, <laughs> no matter what time or era you're in. <laughs> I was trying to think of what type of effect hard times could have on people. If there's more people struggling against some type of thing, whether it's a war and there's a shared purpose in trying to defend yourselves or there's an ideological transition. It seems like during times where you're part of a movement, you're probably going to have some honor towards the people that are in that with you. I don't know if that's a flawed viewpoint or maybe a little bit altruistic. That's kind of where my thoughts were going. Right. I kind of get it. We're taken to Gethel, clambering over hills made of bones spread out in all directions. And a quick reminder, Gethel is the Jagut Herald of Hood that Brucalian slashed across the face last chapter in response to Gethel's <laughs> offer to escort the Grey Swords out of Kapustan via Hood's Warren on that topic of honor <laughs> they're honoring their contract <laughs> yes they are the bleeding had slowed from the wound on his face though the vision of one eye was still obscured by an upthrust shard of bone the pain had dulled to a pulsing throb that is incredibly gruesome to have to look at your own bone <laughs> in your line of sight and there's nothing you can do about it it's terrible absolutely terrible <laughs> Yeah, got to remember to talk good uh, around Brickalian. Uh, he was really fast with that slash too, man. That was like really fast. Can you imagine if you're one of those people that can't stand the sight of anything like this, any type of bone or blood, they pass out instantly. <laughs> you, you can't look away. It's in your line of sight. I guess at best you could try and close that eye and hold it closed, but I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> Well, funny enough, I don't think this world has much room for people that can't stand the sight of blood. It True. It <laughs> seemed to be True. at least. Wasn't there somebody that didn't like the sight of blood? I'm trying to remember. Was Krupp like that? Oh, yeah. I <laughs> oh, I think you're right, sir. There is, there is somebody that can't stand. Oh, my good gracious. I'm going to have to dig into this. I'll see if I can find something. Okay. Gethel mumbled, vanity is not my curse. No, predicting mortal humans. No, not even Hood could have imagined such insolence. But ah, the herald's visage is now broken, and that which is broken must be discarded. Discarded. Gethel looked around. The endless hills, the formless sky, the cool, dead air, the bones. His undamaged eyebrow lifted. He said, nonetheless, I appreciate the joke, Hood. Ha ha. Here you have tossed me. Ha ha. And now I have leave to crawl free, free from your service. So be it. He opened his warren, stared into the portal that formed before him, his path into the cold, almost airless realm of Omtos Falak. And that would be the warren of the Jagut. Gethel said, I know you now, Hood. I know who, what you are. Delicious irony, the mirror of your face. Do you in turn, I now wonder, know me? Is this 
guess all recognizing the ID. I mean, I guess he's not known the ID of his boss, Hood. Who he's been working for Hood, right? He has. I guess there's a couple of interpretations here. Maybe he's surprised by some characteristics of Hood or Hood himself. It's hard to say. We don't really get a lot of information here. Right, right, right. Okay. Copy that. Gethel strode into the Warren. The familiar Gelid embrace eased his pain. Gelid. Yeah, that's one of my words. <laughs> 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 that, along with <laughs> Limed, <laughs> those oh, two. <laughs> They, oh, limed. Yeah, those two <laughs> because they're both dealing with cold. I always think of those together. But yeah, of course, ochre. The steep, jagged walls of ice to either side bathed him in blue-green light. He sniffed the air and found no stench of eye mass or signs of intrusion. Yet the power he sensed around him was weakened, damaged by millennia of breaches, the effrontery of Talan. Like the Jagut themselves, Amtos Falak was dying a slow wasting death. And that's interesting. That's the first indication I recall hearing that these elder Warrens can weaken and die out. For some reason, I always thought there was some permanence to them, almost like an elemental force. I had that very same impression. Like the bedrock of the magic in this universe is on these elders. And so I too kind of thought that they would stay forever. Yeah, because when you think of darkness, the Tistandi are not required for darkness to exist, but maybe Mother Dark has something to do with that. That might be a little bit different. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Maybe there's some central force involved in Amtos Falak that is either not paying attention or is weakening like Karul is, and for whatever reason, it's going away. Right. Just simple non-use, kind of slow death of non-use. Gethel whispered, ah, my friend, we are almost done. You and I spiraling down into... Oblivion. A simple truth. Shall I unleash my rage? No. After all, my rage is not enough. It never was. He walked on and came across an unexpected fissure. A warm breath flowed from it, sweet with decay and disease. The ice lining its edges was bruised and pocked, riven with dark veins. Halting before it, Gethel quested with his senses. He hissed in recognition and said, You have not been idle, have you? What is this invitation you set before me? I am of this world, whilst you, stranger, are not. He moved to step past it, his torn lips twisting into a snarl, then stopped, head slowly turning. He whispered, I am no longer Hood's herald, dismissed, a flawed service, unacceptable. What would you say to me, chained one? There would be no answer, until the decision was made, until the journey's end. Gethel entered the fissure. Question here, then, so is he dismissed from the service of Hood just for simply getting his face smacked? No. Okay. In this conversation that's coming up here, they do dial in exactly why he's no longer in the service of Hood. So when I read that, I'll let you know. Copy that. Gethel was amused to see the crippled god had fashioned a small tent around his place of chaining. Broken, shattered, oozing with wounds that never healed. Here, then, was the true face of vanity. Gethel halted before the entrance, then raised his voice and said, Dispense with the shroud. I shall not crawl to you. The tent shimmered, then dissolved, revealing a robed, hooded, shapeless figure sitting on damp clay. A brazier lifted veils of smoke between them, and a mangled hand reached out to fan the smoke into the hood-shadowed face. The crippled god wheezed, a most devastating kiss. Your sudden lust for vengeance was felt, Jagoot. Your temper endangered Hood's meticulous plans. You see that, do you not? Mm. It was this that so disappointed the Lord of Death. His herald must be obedient. His herald must possess no personal desires, no ambitions. Not a worthy employer for one such as you. So that's what I was saying. Does that answer your question? Yes, that most assuredly answers my question. Just that quick outburst of temper against the will of Hood earned him this enmity, this lickety split, apparently. Thanks, sir. So he was sent to recruit the Grey Swords, gets slashed in the face, and immediately goes to guns. He's going to take some type of action against Brucalian immediately. And then he gets stopped because the IMAS step in. Otherwise, he would have taken Brucalian out. And presumably, right. Hood may still have wanted to try and do something with the Grey Swords. Copy that. Okay. Gethel glanced around and said, There is heat beneath me. We chained you to Burns' flesh, anchored you to her bones, and you have poisoned her. The crippled god said, I have, a festering thorn in her side, 
that shall one day kill her, and with Burns' death this world shall die. Her heart cold, lifeless, will cease its life-giving bounty. These chains must be broken, Jagut. Gethel laughed and said, All worlds die. I shall not prove the weak link, crippled god. I was here for the chaining, after all. The crippled god hissed, Ah, but you are the weak link. You ever were. You thought you could earn Hood's trust, and you failed. Not the first failure, either, as we both know. When your brother Gothos called upon you... <laughs> what? Gothos's brother? Yeah. I wonder how different they are. We really don't have an idea of Gothos's disposition. We saw one small conversation in Deadhouse Gates, and that's about it. And it was really hard to tell what type of individual he was, what his temperament was from that conversation. Yeah, we have some side notes about him as we approach him through uh, you know, through the entirety of Deadhouse Gates. You hear little nuggets dropped about Gothos, not much, but I too completely forgot that he's his Gothos's brother. So that makes him Ikarium's uncle. Yeah. Doesn't seem to be much of a role model, though. No. I don't think any of the Jugut are necessarily role model-y type of folk. <laughs> not that we've met so far. Yeah. Ikarium, strangely enough, is kind of swayed, but he's, you know, he's calf. He is, but he gets mad <laughs> and can destroy yeah, yeah, the entire right. world he in the process. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it is an interesting dichotomy, is it not? <laughs> yeah. Gethel shouted, enough! Who is the vulnerable one here? The crippled god said, we both are, Jagut. We both are. The god raised his hand again, waved it slowly between them. Lacquered wooden cards appeared, suspended in the air, their painted images facing Gethel. The crippled god whispered, Behold, the house of chains. Gethel's lone functioning eye narrowed. He asked, What? What have you done? The crippled god said, No longer an outsider, Gethel. I would join the game. And look more carefully. The role of herald is vacant. Gethel grunted, More than just the herald. The crippled god said, Indeed. These are early days. Who, I wonder, will earn the right of king in my house? Unlike Hood, you see, I welcome personal ambition. Welcome independent thought, even acts of vengeance. Gethel said, the deck of dragons will resist you, chained one. Your house will be assailed. The crippled god said, it was ever thus. You speak of the deck as an entity, but its maker is dust, as we both know. There is no one who can control it. Witness the resurrection of the house of shadows, a worthy precedent. Gethel, I have need of you. I embrace your flaws. None among my house of chains shall be whole, in flesh or in spirit. Look upon me. Look upon this broken, shattered figure. My house reflects what you see before you. Now cast your gaze upon the world beyond, the nightmare of pain and failure that is the mortal realm. Very soon, Gethel, my followers shall be legion. Do you doubt that? Do you? Gethel was silent for a long time. Then he growled, The House of Chains has found its herald. What would you have me do? Why am I getting the feeling of the crippled god recruiting, resembling Nick Fury recruiting the Avengers in the Marvel <laughs> MCU? Does it feel that way to you as well? <laughs> Dude, very much so, because think about it. In this book, we, you know, we had never really seen the crippled god at all. We've seen his machinations apparently at work and didn't know it. But all of a sudden, he's kind of like in a little bit in every chapter here, a little here, a little here. But yeah, it's very much like the uh, crippled Avengers, as it were. <laughs> uh, this does remind me, I'm so sorry, uh, but there is a 1978 kung fu movie called the crippled avengers dude. are you kidding me <laughs> dude, but the crippled avengers i kid you not i put the trailer here for you it's amazing and i'm sorry i love shaw brothers type stuff that's why i love kill bill so much but it's like the same thing these guys are mutilated horribly by some vicious shogunate sons of guns and they gouge out one guy's eyes deafen the other guy and cut the other fellow's legs off and then you know and then these guys they go <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm not making this stuff up. It's fantastic. Go check it out. The Crippled Avengers from 78. And then if you want to see it with a great bookend movie, you need to see The Five Deadly Venoms. Another brilliant kung fu movie. <laughs> How have I never heard of this movie before? <laughs> Sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, it, it is most assuredly ridiculous, Dave. You know, it's okay. the kung fu movies. You got the flapping shirts and the pa pa pa. You know, all that. You know, it goes off uh -huh. about twenty five minutes of those kind of fights that I love so much. It's it's great, dude. You, cool. You just have to I'll see have to it. check it out. That's another t shirt idea. <laughs> I don't know if you could come up with that nowadays. Like you, <laughs> like you tried. Please try. We can bring it back. <laughs> 
<laughs> bring it back <laughs> i'm writing it down i gotta put it in the notebook i don't oh. know well um <laughs> Do we need to market test this one? Along with the other story I have, I could inform you about, but I don't know if I should bring it on the air or not. Uh, oh, hold off on that. <laughs> also, the Crippled God's recruitment game is quite strong. He does offer a compelling case to those we've seen so far, at least until they realize what a mistake they made when whatever he's offering them turns out to be not at all what they thought. Case in point, the artisan at the beginning of the book with the tumors that he was going to have healed and then he turns into a paraplegic. Yeah, it's pretty rough. <laughs> I'm sorry, that is rough, dude. I agree. That's just brutal. Yeah. Brutal and wrong. It's wrong, sir. It's wrong. And Cruel was right to warn Lady Envy to protect talk from the crippled god because he oh. is a prime target. Oh, yeah. He's mangled and he's kind of hurting and yes, very and very well done. We are taken to Brood's camp. Marilio muttered, I've lost my mind, but he threw the bones nonetheless. They bounced and rolled, then came to a stop. Krupp cried, the Lord's push, dear friend. Alas, for you, but not for worthy self. <laughs> he reached out to gather the bones and said, and now Krupp doubles the bid on a clear skid. Ah, exquisite rhyme, exquisitely delivered. Ho! <laughs> the bones bounced, settled with unmarked sides facing up. He cried, ha! Riches tumble upon Krupp's ample lap. Gather them up, formidable wizard. Shaking his head, Quick Ben collected the finger bones and said, I've seen every cheat possible, the bad and the superb. But Krupp, you continue to evade my sharpest eye. <laughs> Even Quick Ben is confounded by Krupp's slippery nature. That is oh, incredible. It's remarkable. Quick Ben is kind of one of those fellows that sometimes fills us in on the deets on the side on what's going on. And if he doesn't know, no one knows. And... I'm going to go back to a quick point and something we were talking about previously with Gethal and the Crippled God I forgot to mention. Did you catch that detail that the Crippled God mentioned that we both know that the creator of the Deck of Dragons is dust? Yeah. Like, we know who he is. <laughs> yeah, we know who he is. Yeah. I mean, I assume so. They were all probably around at the same time, if they're that old. I guess so. Um, I guess you're right. I just never thought about it. I, don't, I didn't know if the deck was one of these things that kind of... Because sometimes things seem to arise in there naturally of themselves because it seems to have become its own thing. Does it need a maker? True. I'm assuming it's cruel that they're referring to. Oh. Because who else would it be? The deck of dragons is aspected. It's connected to the Warrens. So uh -huh. every house is aspected related to a Warren and the Warrens are cruel. I would think that the deck was created by him. And given cruel's decline, if it is cruel that created the deck of dragons, then that makes sense to me. But they say that cruel is dust and he's now back on the scene though. I guess is Cripple God unaware of that fact. He's playing a very subtle game. Okay. He's the shaved knuckle in the hole. <laughs> yes. I think he's trying to influence as much as he can without getting too heavily involved as of yet. Okay. Very cool. Krupp said, cheat, gods forbid. What hapless victims are witness to on this night of nights is not but cosmic sympathy for worthy Krupp. <laughs> Marilio snorted, cosmic sympathy? What in Hood's <laughs> name is that? Call grumbled, euphemism for cheating. Make your call quick. I'm eager to lose still more of my hard-earned coin. Marilio said, it's this table. It skews everything. And somehow Krupp's found the pattern. Don't deny it, you block of cheesy lard. Dude, <laughs> when I read this, I laughed because one of our huskies is rather plump, and we call her <laughs> lard. <laughs> no. Are you body shaming, sir? We got it from Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> it's okay. Because he calls Tina the okay. the llama a fat lard. He goes, Tina, oh. eat. <laughs> you fat lard. Okay. Krupp said, Krupp denies all things patently deniable, dearest companions. No pattern has yet formed by way of sincerest assurance, for the principal in question has fled from his appointed role. Said flight not but an illusion, of course, though the enforced delay in self-recognition may well have direst consequences. Fortunate for one and all, Krupp is here with cogent regard. Quick Ben cut in, whatever. Dark heart where it matters most, and skull in the corner. Krupp said, bold wager, mysterious mage. Krupp challenges trouble with a true hand and not a nudge askew. Quick Ben snorted then said, never seen one of those. Ever. Not ever. Not once. <laughs> he sent the bones skidding across the table. The polished finger bones came to a stop, arrayed in a spread hand. All the symbols and patterns revealing perfect alignment. Krupp said, and now, wondering wizard, you have. 
Krupp's coffers <laughs> overflow. <laughs> Quickman stared at the skeletal hand on the table surface. <laughs> Call side then said, what's the point of this? Krupp wins every cast. Not subtle, little man. A good cheat makes sure there's losses thrown in every now and then. Krupp said, thus Krupp's true innocence is displayed. A cheat of successive victories would be madness, indeed. No, this sympathy is true and well beyond Krupp's control. 4D chess tactics from Krupp here. A true cheat wouldn't win every round. It's a sound defense, if you think about it. (laughs) I think it is astonishing logic, but what's funny, I could just see that last cast where it comes out in the shape of that hand. That's like a Bugs Bunny throw. It's like, <laughs> just see anyone else but Bugs Bunny throwing that dice out or those bones out and having it make a perfect skeletal hand. And for him to go, and now you have, and for, who, 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 who could make that argument but crop, dude? That's amazing. It'd be funny if they just kind of like went into place, like, they're magnetic and there's magnets aligned yes, right there. Yeah. It's exactly <laughs> what I'm seeing. Click, 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 click. <laughs> Quick Ben whispered, how did you do that? <laughs> Krupp removed a silk handkerchief from his sleeve and mopped his brow. He said, Warrens suddenly abound, licking the air with invisible flames. Ay! <laughs> Krupp withers beneath such scrutiny. Mercy, Krupp begs you, malicious mage. Quick Ben leaned back, glanced over to where Whiskey Jack sat apart from the others, his back to the tent wall, his eyes half closed. Quick Ben said, there's something there. I swear it, but I can't pin him down. He's slippery. Gods, he's slippery. <laughs> Whiskey Jack grunted. He grinned and said, give it up. You won't catch him, I suspect. <laughs> Quick Ben swung his gaze to Krupp and said, you are not what you seem. Call interrupted. Oh, but he is. Look at him. Greasy. Slimy. Slick like one giant hairy ball of buttered eel. Krupp is precisely as he seems. Trust me. Look at the sudden sweat on his brow. The boiled lobster face. The bugged out eyes. Look at him squirm. That's Krupp, every inch of him. Krupp exclaimed. Abash it is Krupp. Cruel scrutiny. Krupp crumbles beneath such unwarranted attention. They watched as Krupp wrung out the handkerchief, their eyes widening at the torrent of oily water that poured from it to pool on the tabletop. Whiskey Jack barked a laugh and said, he has you all in his belt pouch. Even now, squirm, is it? Sweat? All an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> is Krupp really just a thin, weaselly, clean-cut fella? And this is a slovenly, this is like a carefully crafted illusion, the slovenly, f- sweaty, fat, white guy to draw everyone, keep everyone, you know, at ease, think they could be superior to? I think I've posited this before with different verbiage in another, another episode. For our listeners, for more digressions on sweaty white guy thing. Yeah, I don't think it is. <laughs> I think he's truly what okay. he is because he's eating food all the time. Is he? Yeah, I think he is. He's juggling food and he's putting it in his sleeves, carrying it around. Yeah, we do see him eat in gardens. We did see him eat. Okay, never mind. I'll take that back. Okay, you know what, though? If he's a master of sleight of hand, I guess theoretically he could pretend he's eating. That'd be the easiest trick of all, I think. But if he, I mean, in some cultures, especially in more ancient cultures, being fat is mean is a sign of wealth. So I mean, he could just be the fat guy anyhow, just because it's he's wealthy enough to be fed a lot. I don't know if that's something we've seen in the cultures in the Malazan right. books. I know in the real world, at times in history, certain cultures have viewed that as like, oh, that you have an excess of resources, so you can afford right. to be fat. You don't have to work in the fields right. and all that kind of stuff. But I haven't really picked up any cultures that i recall from the malazan books that think the same way oh well, we've got the warrior cultures yeah we have a ton of cultures um, that are all warriors <laughs> well even the nobility you think of the nobles in Darujistan. i never picked up that it was looked highly upon to be big no no i never caught that either they never really made any comment not specifically saying that any of them were viewed in a more desirable manner because they were larger than anybody else. Right. I agree. I don't think we have we not gone into that. Same thing with the nobles in Unta. Yeah. Didn't see anything about that there yeah. that I recall. And the only character that I really recall thinking that they were larger was Tattersail, right. but there was no value associated with that. It was just part yeah. of her character, yeah. the way she was. Okay. Very cool. 
Krupp said. Krupp buckles under such perceptive observations. He wilts, melts, dissolves into a blubbering fool. He paused and leaned forward and gathered in his winnings. He went on. Krupp is thirsty. Does any wine remain in that smudged jug, he wonders? Yet more than that, Krupp wonders what has brought Corlat to the tent's entrance here in the dead of night, with one and all exhausted by yet another day of interminable marching. The flap was drawn back and Corlat stepped into the lantern light. Her violet eyes found Whiskey Jack. She said, Commander, my lord requests the pleasure of your company. Whiskey Jack raised his brows. He said, now? Very well, I accept the invitation. He rose slowly, favoring his bad leg. Quick Ben said, I'll figure you out yet, glaring at Krupp. <laughs> Good luck. Krupp said, Krupp denies the existence of elusive complexity regarding self, worrisome wizard. Simplicity is Krupp's mistress in joyful conspiracy with his dear wife. Truth, of course. Long and loyal in allegiance, this happy threesome. <laughs> He was still talking as Whiskey Jack <laughs> left the tent and walked with Corlat towards the Tistandi encampment. After a few minutes, he glanced at Corlat and said, I would have thought your lord would have departed by now. He's not been seen for days. Corlat said, he will remain in our company for a time. Anamanda Rake has little patience for staff meetings and the like. Crone keeps him informed of developments. Whiskey Jack said, then I am curious. What would he have of me? Corlat smiled slightly and said, that is for my lord to reveal, commander. Whiskey Jack fell silent. Rake's tent was indistinguishable from all the other tents of the Tistandi, unguarded and a little more than halfway down a row, weakly lit from within by a single lantern. Corlat halted before the flap and said, my escort is done. You may enter, Commander. I think that says a lot about Rake, how his tent is the same as everybody else's in the Tistandi side of the house. That says a lot about him, dude. It's... Uh... He's just down there with everyone else. Just, you know, he's just, he's their commander, but he's just down there with them too. Yeah, just another dude. Love it. He found Anamanda Rake seated in a leather-backed folding camp chair, his long legs stretched out before him. An empty matching chair was opposite, and set to one side within reach of both was a small table on which sat a carafe of wine and two goblets. Rake said, thank you for coming. Please make yourself comfortable. Whiskey Jack settled into the chair. Rake leaned forward and filled the two goblets, passed one over to Whiskey Jack, who accepted it gratefully. Rake said, with the proper perspective, even a mortal life can seem long. Fulfilling. What I contemplate at the moment is the nature of happenstance. Men and women who, for a time, find themselves walking in step on parallel paths, whose lives brush close, howsoever briefly, and are so changed by the chance contact. Whiskey Jack studied Rake through half-closed eyes. He said, I don't view change as particularly threatening, Lord. Rake said, Rake will suffice. To your point, I agree, more often than not. There is tension among the command, of which I am sure you are fully aware. Whiskey Jack nodded. Rake's eyes sharpened on Whiskey Jack's for a moment, then casually slid away once more. He said, Concerns, long bridled ambitions now straining, rivalries old and new. The situation has the effect of separating each and every one of us from all the others. Yet, if we abide, the calm return of instincts makes itself heard once more, whispering of hope. The extraordinary eyes found Whiskey Jack once again, a contact just as brief as the first. Whiskey Jack drew a slow, silent breath. He asked, the nature of this hope? Rake said, my instincts, at the instant when lives brush close, no matter how momentary, inform me who is worthy of trust. Ganoa's parent, for example. We first met on this plane, not too far from where we are now camped. A tool of Opan moments from death within the jaws of shadow thrones hounds a mortal his every loss written plain there in his eyes living or dying his fate meant nothing to me yet whiskey jack said you liked him rake smiled and sipped his wine he said i an accurate summation there was silence then that stretched as the two men sat facing each other after a long while whiskey jack slowly straightened in his chair a quiet realization stealing through him Studying the wine in his goblet, he said, I imagine Quick Ben has you curious. Rake cocked his head, slightly surprised. He said, naturally. Whiskey Jack said, I first met him in seven cities, the holy desert Raraku, to be more precise. He leaned forward to refill both goblets, then settled back before continuing. It's something of a long tale, so I hope you can be patient. Rake half smiled his reply. Whiskey Jack said, good. I think it'll be worth it. His gaze wandered, found the lantern hanging from a pole, settled on its dim, flaring gold flame. He said, Quick Ben, Adiphon Delat, a middling wizard in the employ of one of the seven holy protectors during an abortive rebellion that originated in Aaron. Delat and eleven other mages made up the protector's cadre. 
our besieging army's own sorcerers were more than their match. Bellardan, Nightchill, Tashrin, Acaronis, Tesser, Melandis, Stumpy. A formidable gathering known for their brutal execution of the Emperor's will. Well, the city the Protector was holed up in was breached. The walls sundered. Slaughter in the streets. The madness of battle gripped us all. Dasim. Dasim, Aldo. <laughs> Dasim struck down the Holy Protector. Dasim and his band of followers he called his first sword. They chewed their way through the enemy ranks. The Protector's cadre, seeing the death of their master and the shattering of the army, fled. Dasim ordered my company in pursuit, out into the desert. Our guide was a local, a man recently recruited into our own claw. This is very exciting. We finally get more information about Quick Ben's backstory. Oh, I've been waiting. I've been waiting. What do you think made Whiskey Jack feel comfortable enough to open up here? You know, we talk about the bond of blood that soldiers share, because regardless of age and all soldiers, it's kind of unusual, I guess, in you know, wartime, I mean, wartime soldiers in particular, I think all soldiers from all levels of technology and all experiences have very similar experiences. So that's a kind of an unusual thing that people share. But the other thing here is that he gave him a couple things. Rake said, call me Rake, first off, kind of dropped the formality. Mm, mm -hmm. And then his assessment and acknowledgement and a truly unabashed admiration and liking of parent does a lot to kind of ease it and make it be like, okay, that's a lot for this immortal fella to drop on me. He's mentioning he wants to be friends. He's, he's mentioned this close contact with mortals of short livedness can produce something that lasts forever. So he wants something from this. He's seeking something from Whiskey Jack. So I think Whiskey Jack responds with this, you know, I got something here good for you. <laughs> yeah, I see. When you put it all together like that, that makes sense. And he dropped so much info in this short paragraph. <laughs> We are familiar with all those mages, with the exception of Tessor Melandis. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. And Stumpy. <laughs> Will Stumpy ever measure <laughs> me, uh, measure up to a Stumpy? I'm not sure, but I want to know more about Stumpy because it's almost like a bridge burner type of dude that's lost fingers and other extremities as he dials in the Maranth munitions. Is kind of the thing I got going on, but he sounds formidable as a mage. Or she, I'm sorry. Yeah, could be either. We don't know. All of the other names, they sound like mage names or some type of names that came from antiquity. Yes. And Stumpy, it's like we talked about Kyle, the main <laughs> character from Return of the Crimson Guard. I mean, it just seems so out of place. It's more of a bridge burner name yes. than all of these other ones. It kind of makes you wonder if all these other mages are older and have been around a while. And then Stumpy may have come up through the Malazan ranks and got their name. Could be. I mentioned it was Bridge Burner's sounding name, but think about it. Bellardan, Nightchill, Tashrin, Akarotus, Tesser Melandis, Stumpy. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, dude. It's the same as you're right. It's the same as Kyle. Oh. <laughs> I want to know more about Stumpy. I know. I know. Because <laughs> I agree, Stumpy sounds more like a Malazan person. So I do want to know Stumpy. Kyle is like, Kyle, all I can ever think is South Park, and I'm sorry. That's Trey and Matt's fault. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Erickson. And that's not, that's Mr. Esselman. I'm sorry, Mr. Esselman. Blame Trey and Matt. Your books are fantastic, by the way, Mr. Esselman. <laughs> but, you know, hey. Kyle, Stumpy's acceptable from, from Erickson. <laughs> Stumpy. <laughs> Another thing I noted, this is also, I believe, the first mention of Dasim's first sword, his close band of followers. Yeah, I agree. I don't recall hearing that before. I'd like to know more about those fellas as well. Yeah. <laughs> we are treated to a flashback. Kalam Makar's face glistened with sweat. Whiskey Jack watched as the man twisted in the saddle, then shrugged. Kalam rumbled, they remain together. I would have thought they'd split and force you to do the same or to choose among them, Commander. The trail leads out, sir, out into Raraku's heart. Whiskey Jack asked, how far ahead? Kalam said, half a day, no more, and on foot. Whiskey Jack squinted out into the desert's ochre haze. 
70 soldiers rode at his back, a cobbled together collection of Marines, engineers, infantry, and cavalry, each from squads that had effectively ceased to exist. Three years of sieges, set battles, and pursuits for most of them. They were what Dasim Ultor judged could be spared and, if necessary, sacrificed. Kalam said, Sir, Raraku is a holy desert, a place of power. Whiskey Jack growled, Lead on. Dust devils swirled random paths across the barren, wasted plain. The troop rode on and the sun climbed higher in the sky. Somewhere behind them a city still burned, yet before them they saw an entire landscape that seemed lit by fire. And I bet you that city was Egatan, the same city that the rat divers Grillin was flushed out from. That's my assumption as well, sir. Okay. It's possible it could be another city because, I mean, there was a lot of fighting in this war. But when you hear of fires, yes. Egatan is always <laughs> one of the first ones to, that comes to mind. I think it's caught on fire several times at this point. Yes, exactly. When I see the flames, I think of Egatan very specifically. They discovered the first corpse in the afternoon, curled, a ragged scorched talaba fluttering in the hot wind, and beneath it a withered figure, head tilted skyward, eye sockets hollowed pits. Kalam dismounted and was long in examining the body. Finally, he rose and faced Whiskey Jack and said, Keb Harla, I think. She was more a scholar than a mage, a delver of mysteries. Sir, there's something odd. Whiskey Jack drawled, indeed? He leaned forward in his saddle, studied the corpse, then said, apart from the fact that she looks like she died a hundred years ago, what did you find odd, Kalam? Kalam's face twisted in a scowl. A soldier chuckled behind Whiskey Jack. Without turning, Whiskey Jack called out, Will that funny man come forward, please? <laughs> a rider joined him. Thin, young, an ornate, oversized Seven Cities helmet on his head. The soldier said, Sir. Whiskey Jack stared at him and said, Gods, man, lose that helm. You'll cook your brains. And the fiddle, the damn thing's broken anyway. The soldier said, The helm is lined with cold sand, sir. Whiskey Jack asked, With what? The soldier said, Cold sand. Looks like shaved filing, sir. But you could throw a handful into a fire and it won't get hot. Strangest thing, sir. Whiskey Jack's eyes narrowed on the helmet. He said, by the abyss. The Holy Protector wore that. <laughs> Dude. Wow. He looted the helmet off the Holy Protector. Oh, goodness. Great stuff. The soldier nodded solemnly and said, and when Dasim's sword clipped it, it went flying, sir, right into my arms. So not looted technically, it landed in his hands. <laughs> That sounds to me like one of those picker found the table in the yes, tent yes. type scenarios yes. where there's a little bit of revisionist history going on. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Whiskey Jack asked, and the fiddle followed? The soldier's eyes thinned suspiciously. He said, no, sir, the fiddle's mine. Bought it in Malice City. Planned on learning how to play it. Whiskey Jack asked, so who put a fist through it, soldier? The soldier said, that would be Hedge, sir, that man over there beside Picker. Hedge shouted, he can't play the damn thing. <laughs> the soldier said, well, I can't now, can I? It's broke. But once the war is done, I'll get it fixed, won't I? Whiskey Jack sighed and said, return to your position, sir Fiddler. And not another sound from you, understood? Fiddler said, one thing, sir, I got a bad feeling about, about all of this. Whiskey Jack said, you're not alone in that, soldier. Fiddler said, well, uh, it's just that. Hedge called out, Commander, and nudged his mount forward. He said, the lad's hunches, sir, they ain't missed yet. He told Sergeant Nubber not to drink from that jug, but Nubber did anyway, and now he's dead, sir. Whiskey Jack asked, poisoned? Hedge said, no, sir, a dead lizard got stuck in his throat. Nubber choked to death on a dead lizard. Hey, Fiddler, a good name that, Fiddler, ha! Whiskey Jack said, gods, enough. <laughs> Dude, it sounds like me and my boys having a conversation. <laughs> The ridiculousness. <laughs> Are you trying to interpret what's going on? I can imagine. So, so the question, did Hedge or Whiskey Jack just name Fiddler? It looks like Hedge actually said it sounds like a good name, but Whiskey Jack said Sir Fiddler. Like a designation, not a name necessarily. Yeah, it sounds like Whiskey Jack threw it out as a sarcastic remark, mm -hmm. and then Hedge cemented it as a nickname. Yeah, and there it lands. Whiskey Jack faced Kalam again and said, ride on. Kalam nodded and climbed back in his saddle. Eleven mages on foot, without supplies, fleeing across a lifeless desert. The hunt should have been completed quickly. Late in the afternoon, they came upon another body, as shriveled as the first one. Then, with the sun spreading crimson on the west horizon, a third corpse was found on the trail. Directly ahead, 
half a league distance, rose the bleached, jagged teeth of limestone cliffs, tinted red with the sunset. The trail of the surviving wizards, Kalam informed Whiskey Jack, led towards them. The horses were exhausted, as were the soldiers. Water was becoming a concern. Whiskey Jack called a halt, and camp was prepared. After the meal, with soldiers stationed at pickets, Whiskey Jack joined Kalam at the hearth. Kalam tossed another brick of dung onto the flames, then checked the water in the battered pot suspended by a tripod over the fire. He rumbled, The herbs in this tea will lessen the loss of water come the morrow. I'm lucky to have it. It's rare and getting rarer. Makes your piss thick as soup, but short. You'll still sweat, but you need that. Whiskey Jack interrupted, I know. We've been on this damn continent long enough to learn a few things, Claw Leader. Kalam glanced over at the se settling soldiers and said, I keep forgetting that, Commander. You're all so... Young, Whiskey Jack said, as young as you, Kalam Mikar. Kalam said, and what have I seen of the world, sir? Scant little. Bodyguard to a holy fala in Aaron. Whiskey Jack said, bodyguard? Why mince words? You were his private assassin. Kalam said, my journey has just begun, is what I was trying to say, sir. You, your soldiers, what you've seen, what you've been through. He shook his head, then said, it's all there in your eyes. Whiskey Jack studied Kalam, the silence stretching. Kalam removed the pot and poured out two cups of the medicinal-smelling brew, handed one up to Whiskey Jack. He said, we'll catch up with them tomorrow. Whiskey Jack said, indeed, we've ridden steady the day through, twice the pace of a soldier's jog. How much distance have we closed with these damned mages? A bell's worth? Two? No more than two. They're using warrens. Kalam frowned and slowly shook his head and said, then I would have lost the trail, sir. Once they entered a warren, all signs of them would have vanished. Whiskey Jack said, yes, yet the footprints lead on, unbroken. Why is that? Kalam squinted into the fire and said, I don't know, sir. Whiskey Jack drained the bitter tea, dropped the tin cup to the ground beside Kalam, then strode away. Day followed day, the pursuit taking them through the battered ravines, gorges and arroyos of the hills. More bodies were discovered, desiccated figures that Kalam identified one after another. Renisha, a sorcerer of high Mianus. Keluger, a septime priest of Driss, the Worm of Autumn. Narkal, the warrior mage sworn to Fainer and aspirant to the god's mortal sword. Ulin, the soul-taken priestess of Soliel. I think Soliel is a new one. We've heard of the other ones before. Yeah. Soliel is known as the Lady of Health. She's also referred to as the Mistress of Healing. Did we mention her in relation to Poliel? Aren't they kin? For some reason, I thought we maybe mentioned this before or something. Like, maybe I'm thinking Poliel. No, I think you might be right. Poliel might have been mentioned in Dead House Gates, possibly. I think she's like Plague. Yeah, she's kind of the inverse of Soliel. Yeah, Plague and Sickness kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Aspirant to the Mortal Sword of Fainer is another interesting thing in there. I wonder if Fainer had a different Mortal Sword back in this time period. Well, does Aspirant sound like there may be possible other runners up so to speak to the mortal sword role like you aspire to be maybe there's some other folks that are on the cusp of being this there and then one gets picked possibly actually yeah that's a good point maybe the mortal sword was being selected at this point right like a miss usa pageant <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry who can wield the sword the best yeah, yeah. the dancing routines and the footwork <laughs> competition yes <laughs> Who has the best armor? Yes. Who wears it the best? Exactly. Best swearing. Dude, that's another t-shirt idea. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We're on fire tonight, Dan. On yeah. fuego. <laughs> and so, Mr. First Sword Beauty Pageant. I'm just going to put it in like that. <laughs> I love that, dude. That's great. Fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. First That'll probably comes. sell better than the, the <laughs> crippled Avengers. It's like the House of Chains. <laughs> oh, oh, golly. Oh. Deprivation took its toll on the soldiers. Horses died, were butchered and eaten. The surviving beasts thinned, grew gaunt. Had not the mage's trail led Kalam and the others unerringly to one hidden spring after another, everyone would have died there in Raraku's relentless wasteland. They came across more bodies. Set Al Alad Cruel, a jag half-blood who'd once driven Dasim Ultor back a half-dozen steps in furious counterattack, his sword ablaze with the blessing of some unknown ascendant. Etra, a mistress of the Rashan Warren. Birith Era, 
mage of the Cirque Warren, who could pull storms down from the sky. Gelid, witch of the Tennis Warren. Given the legend of Dasim Ultor, this set Alad Cruel must have been quite formidable. Ooh, yeah, to drive him back some at all, from what I understand, that would that's a feat in and of itself. One thing I missed on my first read through, his sword was ablaze with the blessing of some unknown ascendant. Yeah. So that's an interesting detail. I'm curious which ascendant that was. Yeah, agreed. That's a really good question. And now, but one mains remained, ever ahead, elusive. His presence revealed only by the light footprints he left behind. The soldiers were embraced in silence now, Raraku's silence. Tempered, honed, annealed under the sun. The horses beneath them were their match, lean and defiant, tireless and wild-eyed. Whiskey Jack was slow to understand what he saw in Kalam's face when the assassin looked upon him and his soldiers, slow to grasp that the killer's narrowed eyes held disbelief, awe, and more than a little fear. Yet Kalam himself had changed. He'd not traveled far from the land he called home, yet an entire world had passed beneath him. Raraku had taken them all. So epic. What an ordeal mm. they're all going through oh, as part of this. I love this. And this could be a book probably in and of itself almost, I imagine, or at least an interesting si a short story. Yeah. I appreciate getting a little taste of the desert again. Mm. I loved every moment of reading through Dead House Gates. It's nice to be back over there. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> You know, Agreed. I miss the desert. I do far prefer Seven Cities to Gender Bacchus. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Up a steep, rocky channel, through an eroded fissure, and out into a natural amphitheater, and there, seated cross legged on a boulder on the clearing's opposite side, waited the last mage. He wore little more than rags, was emaciated, his dark skin cracked and peeling, his eyes glittering hard and brittle as obsidian. Kalam's reining in looked to be a tortured effort. He managed to turn his horse round, met Whiskey Jack's eyes, and said, Adiphon Delat, a mage of Mianus, he said in a bone-dry rasp, his split lips twisting into a grin. He said, he was never much, sir. I doubt he'll be able to muster a defense. Whiskey Jack said nothing. He angled his mount past Kalam, approached the wizard. Delat whispered, one question. Whiskey Jack said, what? Delat asked, who in Hood's name are you? Whiskey Jack raised a brow and asked, does it matter? Delat said, we have crossed Ruraku entire. Other side of these cliffs is the trail leading down to Gadanispan. You chased me across the holy desert. Gods, no man is worth that. Not even me, Whiskey Jack said. There were 11 others in your company, wizard. Delat shrugged and said, I was the youngest, the healthiest by far. Yet now, finally, even my body has given up. I can go no further. His dark eyes reached past Whiskey Jack and said, Commander, your soldiers. Whiskey Jack asked, what of them? Delat said, they are more and less, no longer what they once were. Ruraku, sir, has burned the bridges of their pasts. One and all, it's all gone. He met Whiskey Jack's eyes in wonder and said, and they are yours, heart and soul, they are yours. Whiskey Jack said, more than you realize. He raised his voice and said, Hedge, Fiddler, are we in place? Two voices shouted, aye. Whiskey Jack saw Delat's sudden tension. After a moment, Whiskey Jack twisted in his saddle. Kalam sat stiffly on his horse a dozen paces back, sweat streaming down his brow. Flanking him and slightly behind were Fiddler and Hedge, both with their crossbows trained on the assassin. Smiling, Whiskey Jack faced Delat once again. Whiskey Jack said, You two have played an extraordinary game. Fiddler sniffed out the secret communications, the scuffed stone faces, the postures of the bodies, the curled fingers, one, three, two, whatever was needed to complete the cipher. We could have cut this to a close a week past. But by then I'd grown curious. Eleven mages. Once the first one revealed her arcane knowledge to you, knowledge she was unable to use, it was just a matter of bargaining. What choice did the others possess? Death by Raraku's hand, or mine, or a kind of salvation. But was it, after all, do their souls clamor within you now, Adiphon Delat, screaming to escape their new prison? But I am left wondering, nonetheless. This game, you and Kalam, to what end? The illusion of deprivation slowly faded from the wizard, revealing a fit, hale young man. <laughs> this scene is so good. I love these guys. Oh. I'm just eating this up. Oh. It's so good. Oh, it's fantastic, dude. I've been, uh, I forget that so much happens in this little story, and it's like it's just the most crucial story, I think, of the whole series almost in many ways for me personally. We get a name for one of my favorite people of all time, Fid. I'm a huge Fiddler fan. And Quick Ben. And we get there's all these stories. It's great, dude. Fantastic stuff. I agree.
Delat managed a strained smile. He said, the clamor has subsided somewhat. Even the ghost of a life is better than Hood's embrace, Commander. We've achieved a balance, you could say. Whiskey Jack said, and you, a host of powers unimagined. On that note, let's review those powers, shall we? He's got Mianus, Shadow, Rashan, Darkness, Cirque, Path of the Sky, or Air and Storm, Saliel, Healing, Fainer, the Boar of War, Driss, the Worm of Autumn, the Jag Half-Blood, we don't know what was passed on from there. Yeah. If it's a Jagoot, you assume some connection to Omtos Falak. Yes. Not sure. And then Tennis, the Path of the Land. Also, that first life that he took, it didn't really specify what her Warren was. So there's still some unknown. Yes, she, it, it hinted that she was probably more of a, just a knowledge base, which would be very potent for these kind of people to have a lot of info on of maybe how to control all of this in one way or another, but not be a practitioner necessarily. But you have to be astute to be able to read it and understand it. But the other thing is, what was the mention of one of those people being a soul taken? Oh, yeah, that's right. I think it was the Ulan soul taken priestess of Soliel. So, yeah, the healer, healer among the group was soul taken. Would he inherit that? That's a good question. Wowzers. Okay, dude. Quick, Ben, you're like the number one. <laughs> He's like Superman. He's got all these <laughs> powers jacked into one. I love it. That's great. Quick, Ben said, formidable, granted, but I have no desire to use them now. The game we played, Whiskey Jack, only one of survival. At first, we didn't think you'd make it, to be perfectly honest. We thought Raraku would come to claim you. I suppose she did in a way, though not in a way I would have anticipated. What you and your soldiers have become? He shook his head. Whiskey Jack said, what we have become, you have shared, you and Kalam. Delat slowly nodded. He said, hence this fateful meeting. Sir, Kalam and I will follow you now, if you would have us. Mm. And that's amazing. Mm -hmm. From enemies to loyal allies, all through their shared experience here. So not just Quick Ben's origin, we've got a bridge burner origin. And I forgot it's one and the same. It's essentially the same story, and it's core, core, core. <laughs> yeah. And he did make a statement in one of these paragraphs about Ruraku burning the bridges of their past. Mm -hmm. So that's where it came from. Yeah. Amazing. Whiskey Jack grunted, then said, the emperor will take you from me. Delat said, only if you tell him, Commander. Whiskey Jack said, and Kalam? He glanced back at the assassin. Kalam rumbled. The claw will be displeased. Then he smiled and said, too bad for Surly. Grimacing, Whiskey Jack twisted further to survey his soldiers. The array of faces could have been carved from stone. A company culled from the army's castoffs. Now a bright, hard core. Under his breath, he whispered, gods, what have we made here? The first bloodletting engagement of the bridge burners was the retaking of Gadanispan, a mage, an assassin, and 70 soldiers who swept into a rebel stronghold of 400 desert warriors and crushed them in a single night. Mm. I love it. We kind of already talked a little bit about this, but this section reminded me of some of the reasons I feel so strongly about the bridge burners yeah. what an experience that would be to endure it's like a crucible it's funny because i have a double thing with the bridge burners because of your love for them when i knew your your love for them going into this series so when i started reading them i was already looking forward to loving them but when you get to this actual story of the bridge burners it's like whoa that is so cool dude it's like, <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's really cool man really cool really cool it's so much more epic now you know because they were legendary status as we we're introduced to them and now we see where that came from yes yes just absolutely awesome dude back in rake's tent the lantern's light had burned low but the tent's walls revealed the dawn's gentle birth the sound of a camp awakening and preparing for the march slowly rose to fill the silence that followed whiskey jack's tale rake sighed and said soul shifting whiskey jack said i Rake said, I have heard of shifting one soul, sending it into a vessel prepared for it, but to shift 11 souls, 11 mages, into the already occupied body of a 12th. He shook his head in disbelief and said, brazen indeed. I see now why Quick Ben requested I probe him no further. His eyes lifted, he said, yet here this night, you unveil him. I did not ask. So this explains how he was able to do what he did to Hairlock. Yeah, it does actually, because he's done it before. First hand yep. experience, yeah. Wishy Jack said, to have asked, Lord, would have been a presumption. 
Rake said, then you understood me. Wishy Jack smiled and said, instinct. I trust mine as well, Anamander Rake. Rake rose from his chair. Whiskey Jack followed suit. Rake said, I was impressed when you stood ready to defend the child Silver Fox. Whiskey Jack said, and I was in turn impressed when you reined yourself in. Rake muttered, yes, eyes suddenly averted and a faint frown marring his brow. He said, the mystery of the cherub. Whiskey Jack said, excuse me? Rake smiled and said, I was recalling my first meeting with the one named Krupp. Whiskey Jack said, I am afraid, Lord, that Krupp is one mystery for whom I can offer nothing in way of revelation. Indeed, I think that effort will likely defeat us all. Rake said, you may be right in that, Whiskey Jack. Whiskey Jack said, Quick Ben leaves this morning to join Perrin and the bridge burners. Rake nodded then said, I shall endeavor to keep my distance, lest he grow nervous. After a moment, Rake held out his hand. They locked wrists. Rake said, a welcome evening just passed. Whiskey Jack grimaced and said, I'm not much for spinning entertaining tales. I appreciate your patience. Rake said, perhaps I can redress the balance some other evening. I have a few stories of my own. <laughs> yeah. Dude. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Whiskey Jack managed to say, I'm sure you have. They released their grips and Whiskey Jack turned to the entrance. Behind him, Rake spoke. One last thing. Silver Fox need have nothing to fear from me. More, I will instruct Kalor accordingly. Whiskey Jack looked down at the ground for a moment and said, I thank you, Lord, then made his way out. Whiskey Jack thought, God's below. I have made a friend this night. When did I last stumble on such a gift? I cannot remember. Hood's breath, I cannot. I find it interesting that Silver Fox is also similar to Quick Ben, another person containing multiple souls. Yeah, a lot of that seems to be going on lately, doesn't it? Yeah, very much in this book in particular. <laughs> for it to be so rare to have all this stuff going on yeah. in Genabacus. Here's a whole bunch of it. <laughs> for stories... I'd like to hear the Segula story. Oh, oh yes. Yes. With and Rake? I, yeah. Mm. How they chased him off after a couple hours. <laughs> yeah. Standing at the tent entrance, Rake watched the old man limp away down the track. A soft patter of talon feet approached from behind. Crone muttered, Master, was that wise? Rake asked, What do you mean? Crone said, there is a price for making friends among such short-lived mortals, as you well can attest from your own typically tragic memories. Rake said, careful, hag. <laughs> Crone asked, do you deny the truth of my words, Lord? Rake said, one can find precious value in brevity. Crone cocked her head and said, honest observation, dangerous admonition, twisted and all too unhappy wisdom, I doubt you'll elaborate. You won't, will you? You'll leave me wondering, pecking endlessly in fretful obsession, you pig. <laughs> Rake asked, do you smell carrion on the wind, my dear? I swear I do. Why not go find it now, this instant? And once you have filled your belly, find Kalor and bring him to me. Dude, Rake sure loves ruffling Crone's feathers, doesn't he? Oh, good gracious. Yes, he does. He has a really good old time doing that. I don't blame him. He's, a, he's, he's got to give her a hard time. It's pretty funny. <laughs> With a snarl, Crone leapt outside, wings spreading explosively, heaving the huge bird skyward. Rake murmured, Corlat, attend me, please. He swung back to the tent's interior. Moments later, Corlat arrived. Rake remained facing the back wall. Corlat said, Lord? Rake said, I shall depart for a short time. I feel the need for Solana's comfort. Corlat said, she will welcome your return, Lord. I'd like to learn more about Rake's relationship with Solana. Agreed. I'm curious if it's due to him being a, you know, a shapeshifter that's his, or soul taken in particular, that's a dragon. If it's something like that, is it, you know, just why does he need this here? Does he draw strength from her in some way? Like Superman from the sun or something like that? I know it's kind of silly to say that, but I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, it seems like she's really loyal to him. We haven't really seen too much of them yet, but I mean, she took a lot of damage from Rake in yeah. Gardens of the Moon. But she did that at the request of Anamander Rake going into that battle. Yeah. That's interesting. I could see her being attached to him. Him having a similar feeling, like he wants to get comfort from her. That's what interests me is I just want to know more about how that works. Yeah. And I'm not sure if he has to be in dragon form or if she's also a soul taken. I don't know. You know he's Tista and D, but he's also soul taken. So which blood is stronger i guess you know why you know he does i guess being the leader of the test and he can't really confab a lot with these people because he's their leader he's got to be seen as having the answers so maybe that's part of it there too mm. rake said a few days absence no more than that corlat said understood rake faced her then said extend your protection to silver fox 
Corlass said, I am pleased by the instruction. Ray constructed, unseen watchers on Kalor as well. Should he err, call upon me instantly, but do not hesitate in commanding the full force of the Tist and down upon him. At the very least, I can be witness to the gathering of his pieces. Corlass said, the full force, Lord? We have not done so in a long, long time. Do you believe it will be necessary in destroying Kalor? Rake said, I cannot be sure, Corlat. Why risk otherwise? Mm. Wow. Even Rake has no idea what it would take to deal with Kalor. And that is surprising to me. <laughs> I'm assuming it is surprising to you as well. Oh, yeah. I was thinking Rake always struck me as, this is going to sound silly, but Batman-esque mm -hmm. from the perspective that he seems to have a plan. Yeah, agreed. And I would think that he's got a plan to deal with Kalor. Yeah. But it sounds like he no. doesn't know exactly what it's going to take to deal with it. Yeah, he does. He's got a plan, but it's not sure if it's be, if it'll be the right one. Yeah. <laughs> Wing attack plan R. <laughs> Doctor Strange love reference. I apologize. <laughs> Corlat said, "Very well. I shall begin the preparation for our Warrens joining." Rake said, "I see that it troubles you, nonetheless." Corlat said, "There are eleven hundred Tistandi, Lord." Rake said, "I am aware of that, Corlat." Corlat said, at the chaining, there were but 40 of us, yet we destroyed the crippled god's entire realm, granted a nascent realm. Nonetheless, Lord, 1100, we risk devastating this entire continent. That's a lot of damage. Ouch. That's a lot. A little overkill. <laughs> Rake's eyes grew veiled. He said, I would advise some restraint in the unleashing, Corlat, should it prove necessary to collectively release Kurald Galane. Brood would not be pleased. I suspect that Kalor will do nothing precipitous in any case. These are all but precautions. Corlat said, understood. Rake turned back to the tense interior and said, that will be all, Corlat. All right, we're going to stop here. We will continue the chapter next week. For standout moments, finding out that Gethel is Gothos's brother and Ikarium's uncle. Yeah, that's a pretty big wow right there, dude. Uh, yeah, Uncle Gethel for Ikarium. <laughs> Not the best uncle role no, model figure no, that no. you want to have Ikarium hanging around. No, not at all. The recruitment tactics of the crippled god and the creation of the House of Chains. And I love your likening it to the MCU. It's like Loki <laughs> going and collecting <laughs> the Infinity Stones or something. You know, it's like he's running around and it's just like, oh my good gracious. It's so funny. I like, I love that dude. That's hilarious. <laughs> Krupp confounding Quick Ben. You mm. love to see it. Yeah, I do like seeing uh, Quick Ben flummoxed. It is quite amusing because, like I said, he always seems to always have the skinny on everything. And so when he doesn't, it's always like, hmm, okay. And now after what we know, it's like, wow, you don't have the skinny on it. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. Whiskey Jack and Rake's conversation, just mm -hmm. in general, not mm -hmm. necessarily the story, but the stuff outside of the story that Whiskey Jack told. Yes, it was good to see them find friendship with one another. I love that because you and I all love that. We always like when the folks find the friendship kind of stuff and to have these two people who are just so, I mean, Whiskey Jack commands the respect of Anamander Rake, who I consider to be the baddest fella in the universe, in the Malazan universe. <laughs> it's like he's got his respect. He has his votes, her. It says a lot. And that's a super core and all the super core memory there for all this Whiskey Jack and Rake stuff, every bit of it. The flashback and the details around Quick Ben's origin story. Mm -hmm. Finding out that Kalam worked in concert with Quick Ben throughout the chase. Both Kalam and Quick Ben volunteering to join the bridge burners after testing their metal and learning who was merged into Quick Ben and what powers they had. And then finally, the small force dominating the forces that outnumbered them in the fort in Gadanispan. Yeah. Dude, outnumbered 10 to 1 pretty much, and it's like all of that, dude, the origin of the of Quick Man, Kalam, Bridge Burners, all being the same story. And I knew it was connected, but not the exact story till we got here, and I kind of just forget that for some reason. But to finally be, to hear an origin story for it all, it's just like, whoa. And it was a nice little palate cleanse for everything that's coming and going, dude. This great stuff. Yeah, and it was a pleasure to return to Seven Cities, yes. however brief it may have been. Agreed. Agreed, sir. Learning about the Tist and D ability to join together in a Power Ranger-like fashion to <laughs> unveil darkness. But that is very cool and somewhat frightening to think that Rake is putting more eyes on Kalor. And the fact that more Tist and D are going to be used in this than in the chaining of the Cripple God has me a little worried about Kalor. <laughs> yes. Kalor, as far as we're aware, is not a god. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we'll send 40 to, to chain this god. But all of you. Yeah, all of you. 
<laughs> are gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah that's that's kind of that's insane yeah and he's, he can never be an ascendant but he's obviously just wackadoodle crazy powerful so man wow yeah if you think back to the prologue it took three elder gods to subdue him in the past yeah they put the curse on him they're very very powerful yeah yeah that's crazy so yeah mm, mm, mm. all right great job tonight billy yeah good great episode man you got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Yeah, just such a super sweet chapter with all these great reveals and all this great friendship, dude. It's fantastic. Great episode. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.